So this is the lecture for sections 41 and 42 from the end of uh, part one of the Doctrine of Right and then moving on to uh, part two of the Doctrine of Right and we'll read some of that in this reading assignment. So starting with the first part of this reading assignment, sections 41 and 42. So they're, uh, they're titled, Transition from what is mine or yours in a state of nature to what is mine or yours in a rightful condition generally. And so uh, although he hasn't like been making a lot out of this point, we've just been reading section one, private right uh, from Kant. And broadly that's kind of about what uh, belongs to you and me in a state of nature or really what belongs to you and me generally. And we start off thinking about that topic from the state of nature. Now it turns out the answer to that question is about like what's the state of nature like is basically look just immediately get yourself into the civil condition that's the only rightful thing you're allowed to do but properly speaking like that's basically what kant has been talking about so far the state of nature so now it's time to move on it's time to transition from the state of nature to civil society so that's sort of what this section and the next section are about and so um read what Kant has to say about that. It would probably sound familiar. And then we get to part two of the Doctrine of Right, this book that we're reading, part two, which is about public right. So what is public right? Public right is uh, the sum of laws which need to be promulgated generally in order to bring about a rightful condition is public right. And then just more detail, public right is therefore a system of laws for people, that is a multitude of human beings, or for a multitude of peoples which, because they affect one another, need a rightful condition under a will uniting them, a constitution, so that they may enjoy what is laid down as right. So if that sounds a little familiar, uh, it should So go back to uh, the very first stuff we read from this book, the introduction to the doctrine of right. And he says, yo, what's up? What's up with the doctrine of right? The sum of those laws for which an external law giving is possible is called the doctrine of right. So the doctrine of right, this whole book, parts one and part two, private right and public right, is the sum of those laws for which an external law giving is possible. We just read the private right stuff, and now we're moving on to the public right stuff. The public right stuff being the sum of those laws which need to be promulgated generally in order to bring about a rightful condition. So it's worth reflecting on what are the similarities and what are the differences between this? What's the similarities between the doctrine of right broadly and public right more narrowly? Uh, it's hard to tell. I don't, I don't know. It, maybe it's not hard to tell. There's, it, since Kant thinks we should basically just immediately be leaving the state of nature and setting up a state, you can kind of imagine why sort of the question of uh, right generally sort of almost immediately turns into the question of public right because all the private right stuff all the stuff you're allowed to do in the state of nature kind of just turns into well you should be making a state so it's worth reflecting on that and what's going on with that one other thing to note about public right is that he divides it into three categories so um, uh, hence under the general concept of public right we are led to think not only of a right of a state, but also the right of nations. And so uh, what this gets us is a threefold division. There's the right of the state, there's the right for a state of nations, and then there's cosmopolitan right. Notice the section that we're reading here, section one, the right of a state. This is all about the first of those three. So right of a state, right of a state of nations, and cosmopolitan right. We're only going to be reading about the rights of a state for quite a while until we get to the right for a state of nations and cosmopolitan right. And then in fact, most of the right for a state of nations and especially most of the cosmopolitan right, we're not gonna read about in this like stuff for Kant. Uh, it's gonna come later in the class when we get to the last stuff Kant wrote. So um, the cosmopolitan uh, stuff especially is coming later in perpetual peace. So uh, he divides public right into three categories, and we're mostly going to be looking at the first category for a while, so the right of a state, so keep that in mind. So that covers the general introductory stuff, and now three things which have come up in class, uh, and which I think three, three, twice I told you uh, you would have read it already. I was referring to this stuff, which we haven't read yet. So uh, first, so the state of nature as a state of dispute. So uh, at one point, uh, not at one point, at multiple points we've been asking, well, why can't we all just get along in the state of nature? What's so good about that? Or what's so bad about that? 
and we've talked about this in class and we've gone back and forth and there have been some answers, but we get another answer from Kant here on page <clears throat> 456 about the state of nature being a state of dispute. So check that out, see what you think about his answer there. Second, on Friday, <clears throat> uh, we talked about marriage and stuff and sexism in Kant, and I said the, the actual sexist stuff is coming soon. And here's our first occurrence of sort of the actual like bad sexist stuff. He's talking about citizenship and he divides things into active and passive citizens and this is an important thing and you want to read about this and he's got a lot to say but um when he's dividing things into active and passive citizens uh oh actually hold on. well yeah as he's dividing up he uh he says there's uh the passive citizens who are sort of not in charge of themselves and the active citizens who are in charge of themselves and the passive citizens include uh for example an apprentice and the servants of a merchant or an artisan a domestic servant a minor okay so these people they're sort of not in charge of themselves they're serving other people or they're minors all women and in general everyone who's without. and so somehow all women are passive citizens according to kant why uh so it i said this is the sexism stuff i'm actually I'm revising this the super duper sexist stuff is coming soon um but this is close to that. So he's saying all women are passive citizens. And so uh, the question is why? And this is covering up stuff. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just give a quick answer. Uh, so the, the non-sexist answer is that all women are passive citizens because, uh, you know, society doesn't give women any property or any rights or anything right now at the time Kant is writing. So women are sort of stuck in the position of minors or uh, apprentices or domestic servants because they just they don't have any of their own stuff so Kant is not saying this is good or bad he doesn't say it's bad to be a passive citizen it's perfectly fine uh, maybe he's a passive citizen I'm not sure actually um, he's not saying it's bad to be a passive citizen he's just dividing people up into categories and saying where they go and he's just saying look it just so happens that all women are passive citizens that's the non-sexist understanding of Kant the sexist understanding of Kant is that uh, look, all women are passive citizens because they sort of must depend on men. Like, they can't make it on their own. They never will be able to make it on their own for the same reason minors can't make it on their own. They're sort of naturally passive. That's sexist, and I, he's basically going to say this later. But uh, that's just to point out, he's not actually saying that here. He might be saying that. He might be, like, alluding to that here. But no, he's not actually saying that. So this is similar to the stuff on Friday about marriage, um, where... I don't know, maybe he's sexist, but maybe not. And then finally, um, at some point, I told people, like, haven't Kant given us, told us this thing about, you? like, you're not supposed to look at the original contract and stuff. And this was when we were having a discussion, I think the Friday before last, um, about, like, how, how it's supposed to work. Like, how are you supposed to force people into a state? Uh, isn't this coercive and stuff like that? And I was giving a picture of how this would work for Kant and blah. Anyways. If you remember that discussion, that's great. If you don't, that's okay. Um, it's just the thing I was referring to when he was saying, don't look into the state of nature. Don't don't go back and try to figure out the original contract or whatever. Um, that's here. So it starts on page 461. If people should not inquire with any practical aim and view into the origin of the supreme authority to which it is subject, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes down here and he explains why. So that's just what I was talking about. So keep your eyes open for that. And for the, everything else, this is a important, like this whole reading section is an important part of Kant's political philosophy, so have fun.